just a quick overview of, uh, of who we are as Metrolinx. We're uh, the Regional Transportation Planning Agency and our mission is to champion and deliver mobility solutions for the DTHA. And essentially we plan, we deliver, and we operate. So the planning we do is the, around the big move and mobility hubs and stationary planning. We deliver in terms of the GO infrastructure that we build as well as the regional uh, things like Eglinton that we're working on, as well as programs like the Smart Commute program that we deliver in partnership with, with, our, with other agencies. And finally, we operate. So we're uh, GO Transit, uh, regional uh, rail and bus is uh, an operating division as will be the airport rail link as well as uh, uh, now the Presto uh, air guard system. So these are the four questions for the panel and what I'd like to do is I'll just step through them quickly and give you a few comments. Um, the first one is, is a complete street policy necessary in Canadian municipalities? Uh, my personal sense is it's helpful, it's very black, isn't it? It's helpful, but to me it's more about culture in that if you have a policy and you don't have the culture, it doesn't get you very far. If you don't have a policy but you have the culture right, you can, you can do tremendous things. Um, and, and I think a fundamental thing about complete streets is that it's an interdisciplinary exercise and working together across disciplines is core to that. So overcoming silos is an important step. And uh, a few years ago I was talking to Brent Tadarian at the city of Vancouver and I thought a great comment he said is that some of his best uh, urban designers were traffic engineers. And that's a great statement on, on culture. Um, in terms of projects themselves, I think there's an, in terms of overcoming solids, is how you structure the projects important, both in terms of the objectives, but also the team itself. Uh, and I just wanted to give, a, I think, what was a good example. I worked uh, previously as a consultant uh, in Seattle, where I worked on a project on the North Waterfront in Seattle that started, I worked as, I was the project manager for an engineering consulting firm, and it started as a grade separation uh, for rail along the waterfront and we had a, a planning firm with us, uh, but we realized very quickly that it was a rapidly developing area of the waterfront, and the problem we were trying to fix wasn't really the problem we should be fixing. <laughs> so we, we went back to the client and we said, you know what, we're gonna change, we wanna change how we're approaching this project, both in terms of the team, so we, we flip-flop roles where I became the transport lead rather than the overall project manager, and the design firm led it, which takes a fair amount of trust uh, across disciplines. Uh, and secondly, we re redefine the objectives of what we're trying to achieve there. And I think the outcome, and, it, and it, the outcome actually got funded and moved forward to a better solution. Um, uh, the other thing about <laughs> uh, silos and, and working across disciplines is therapy. Uh, Metrolinx uh, is a recently merged organization, and uh, like every other organization I've worked at, in working across your discipline boundaries is not always easy uh, and it takes time and patience and uh, a little support. Uh, so therapy is important. Uh, I think a good example uh, was another project that I did in Redmond, Washington where the client structured the project for success and that it was a partnership between public works and uh, uh, planning. And I came in as project manager so it was a great start to the project but it took for the first few months, it was therapy. I mean, we just, it was getting them to communicate and work well together was a struggle, to the point where I was significantly through the project budget and we hadn't shown a lot of progress and I was worried. But it was well invested because by the end of the project, we were, we had agreed on basic principles, the decision making was fast, people were aligned, and by the end, we ended both on budget, but had a solution that worked fantastically. So taking the time to a little bit of therapy and a little bit of red wine can go a long, <laughs> a long way. Um, a couple of misconceptions. So this is where I get into um, the ITE journal. Uh, this, I, I love this cover because ITE is, I have to say, has the worst covers, uh, uh, to be honest. Uh, this is their sustainability issue. I just got this in the mail recently, and they have a complete streets article in this, with complete with quote from uh, Jane Jacobs. So it's always good to quote Jane Jacobs. But the color, the cover is just just pains me, and I don't know if people have the same reaction. But it, I think the misconception about complete streets is it gets distilled down to bike lanes and pedestrians, and it gets distilled down to if we throw in a bike lane, we have a complete street. 
And it's even better if it's a totally empty bike lane. Um, so, so, so the, having the cover is just like putting a bike lane, like a sustainability cover with a bike lane with no people on it is just, anyway. <laughs> I have a strong reaction to it. So, oh, skip that one. Um, so, to me, it's, I think what's important in complete streets is the entirety of it, the trade offs that you have to uh, play with, and, and fundamentally recognizing it's about the urban realm, city building, and the package as a whole, and trading off the different uses. It has to be more than just about bikes and pedestrians getting a fair shake. It has to be, does it work as a system? Um, a, a good, I have a good European example. Uh, there's a publication that's probably a few years old now called Lincoln Place uh, out of the UK, and, and I think, and this starts to get into a little bit in the urban suburban divide, where it talks about place in relation to links or mobility. Uh, and across the top is the, the sort of importance of the place or the context of the place, and across the side, access is what it means in terms of uh, the movement and mobility and there's, and there's guidance on what measures and what approaches work depending on the context. In our mobility hub guidelines we, we use some of that in the sense that we try to make match the context to the solutions. Um, and uh, I also wanted to give, we like to give good European examples so I thought I'd give a bad one just to level the playing field a little. Um, I, work, I, I lived and worked in Edinburgh, Scotland for a number of years, uh, and my, my office was in downtown Edinburgh. And I walked every day uh, up this corridor to the new town. Um, and I'm just gonna zoom in there, because to me this is a classic, this is about trade-offs. Uh, the corridor here is along the end road, which is a major uh, arterial into the city. And you can even see on the satellite photos is this area here, is a huge pedestrian connection. It's just all day long, there's just a constant stream of people. And to the right, the road to the right is going to a parking structure, and there's almost no traffic there. And the design solution just doesn't recognize, it doesn't serve the people. Like if you looked at the people, if you looked at the problem, you'd come to a different design solution. And so you have this convoluted path that people have to walk when in fact what they want to do is that. So I think in this case, Understanding the problems you're looking at and, and getting to trade-offs is important. Uh, what I think is ironic about this one is the gates. Uh, the gates are a safety solution, right? They, they protect people, they protect women and children, except for this woman and child who's uh, ignoring it and pretty much everyone else. So to me, that's a, a design failure. Um, 